Hear ye, hear ye. Court has come to order. Today the Lord has called us to court. And no, you didn't receive a subpoena or a summons. Some of you weren't even arrested this week. <laughs> so s six months ago, we were in the book of Micah. We we're going through a study, and some of you weren't, had never attended this church before six months ago. So I'll bear with me as we study through this book as, we, as the Lord sees fit. But th at that time, we were in a town. And now what we've got in that town is we've got a town crier or a prophet. And he's making an announcement on behalf of the Lord. Today, the Lord is, uses the illustration of a courtroom to teach of his righteousness and our failures and his desire for our lives. He also announces the punishment for those that know his law and ignore his law and live by other laws. Let's pray. God, we come before you. God, you are on your throne right now, ruling in righteousness. As we, your flawed children, sit underneath you, God, keep that vision of the songs we sing, that we need you, that you are on your throne, that you are in righteousness, that you are righteousness, that you are the standard bearer. God, let that be, we want to behold it. We just sang that we behold who you are, where you are, your position above us. God, make these words clear. Make them concise. Give us a testimony, Lord, by your law, by your word, by your truth, that our testimony would be so clear in our hearts, so clear in our lives, that it would affect change in the here and now, and that it would affect change in heaven, that you would see it and be pleased by our testimony, that it would be a testimony in some way, shape, or form by your spirit, that it would be worthy of the king, of the ruler, of the righteousness sitting on a throne right now and forevermore. God, and I ask you to prepare us. Prepare us for the day of judgment. Each one in this room be ready to be called before you. Help us, Lord. We can only do that by your spirit. We can only do that through your son. So we ask for that now. We ask That's a bold prayer, and we ask for it now. In his name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our text, as Sam just read so well for us, starts out with the people with a case against God. The Lord tells them, let's hear it. You've got a case against me? I want to hear what you have to say against me. Listen, the mountains I created, they're in a perfect position to hear your case too. Let, let me hear your plea against me. These mountains are over you and above you. They're a perfect vantage point to see what's going on here. What is your problem with me, the Lord? The, the Lord has wronged the nation of Israel. The mountains were there way before the Israelites were. And these mountains have seen the Israelites vacate the land given to them and head south, south to Egypt. And then the mountains were there when, Egypt, uh, when Israel left Egypt and came north, back to their land that the Lord had promised them. And the mountains and hills saw the Lord part the Red Sea and a deliverance that could only be delivered by the Lord. No one else was going to save them from Pharaoh and his army. And they watched as Pharaoh's and his army were swallowed up by that sea and destroyed under the Lord's hand. And we don't hear from the people what their indictment of the Lord is, but we know it's there. We don't hear directly. They have no words. It seems the Lord's calling them out. Tell me what your problem is, basically. And our text doesn't show that they have a word to say to him. But the Lord's indictment of them clarifies his indictment of them. Ah, their indictment of him. The Lord's indictment of the people shows us and tells us, exposes what the people felt the Lord was doing against them. As part of his prosecution, God asks a series of questions in this courtroom. 
What have I done to you? Another claim, this is clear, that the people have a case against God. God is acting against them in their opinion. You can see that there in the text. They are also understanding that the Lord has not carried them. He's not lifted them up. He's not given them eagle's wings. But contrary, they claim he's tired them out, that he's wearied them. And he asked them, these defendants in this courtroom, how have I wearied you, wearied you? And then he demands a response. Answer me. Tell me what I've done. I want to stop real quick for a point of application here. The Lord's people have a case against him. And the Lord would not tell the people to plead their case if they didn't have one. They've taken a side against God. The prior chapters of Micah also describe this very well, that they've taken a case against the Lord. There's nothing saying that they put it together in writing or speech or explicitly made an argument against God. It's very clear that their evidence, their case against God was evidenced by their lives, by how they lived. The previous description of the people's behavior against God. How they treated each other was horrific in this book of Micah that we've studied. They ate each other, it says in this book. And they used each other to build their own kingdoms with no regard to the Lord's kingdom. And they did this at each other's expense. That's just the introduction of what the Lord's people have done against him by acting against each other. So the application, don't, answer, don't enter a court case you can't win. And if you agree with this and hear my argument before you, you can't win a case against God. He is perfect. He is just. We just sang about it. He is justice. The mountains are good witnesses. Right? We just said that. They've been there a long time. They have a great vantage point over the people. But they pale into comparison to the witness that the Lord is. He knows every attitude, every action, every thought, every reason why we do something. We've got some pretty good prosecuting attorneys in the state of Maine, in the United States for that matter. Not a one of them holds any of these attributes that the Lord holds. He is not a party we want to take to court. So if the word today has you convinced that you've never consciously indicted the Lord, that's good. You've never decided to purposely take up a case against your God who's good and gracious. And that is something, and maybe for some of you, just doing that would be a step forward in your life. Micah doesn't tell us of the Israelites waking up one day making that foolish conscious decision either. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, hey, they just woke up and decided to make a case against God. And I don't think we're going to be foolish enough probably to do that either. But their path of sin led them to absolutely horrific things and an absolutely horrible testimony against God. These Israelites are more like people that, in court, that end up in court nowadays. They go downtown, I think in a sense, I say in a sense, they go downtown for dinner. They didn't realize it beforehand, but it's two for one margarita night. <laughs> They're having a good time. They stay a little longer than they should. And two times four kind of gets exponential. And they end up in a court case, right? Our lives are evidence. Our eyes are an argument for or against the Lord. And listen, at any given time, the Lord could call us. He could call you, could call me to plead our case before him. He has that right. He's on that throne. We sing those beautiful songs that Justin picked. They're true. They're wonderful. But he's on a throne. He's not simply going to take anything and all things with no consequence. That te our text is going to make that clear. He has a law and it is to be followed. Would we, would you have the words like the corrupt leaders in chapter 3? They lean on the Lord amid, amid, Lord amid their sin. 
They're abusing the authority that's granted only by him. They're abusing their power and their reign and their rule. And they're building their own kingdoms at the expense. And they're eating on the flesh of, God, of people God created and God loved, God sacrificed for. God wants to know the truth, wants them to know his law. And they say, is it not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Church, I hope the implication here is clear. We can be in that same boat. Do I know that these people are actually eating their flesh? No, I don't. I don't think they were. I think they were using each other to build up their own kingdoms against the Lord with no regard for the Lord or his law or his love or his mercy. As we live these lives that were given to us by God, how we live them, and from our text especially, I mean, this mic is full of how people treat each other. So how we treat each other today is deeply, deeply, deeply important to God because how we treat each other somehow, some way, through his miraculous will is how we treat him. That's how deeply he identifies with us. He witnesses it all. Not us just singing in church, but on us on a Tuesday morning, we get some more revelation of the, their complaint against him here. They feel that he has not done them good. He says, for I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, and I redeemed you. God brought the deliverance and redemption that Israel could not provide for themselves. And God also declares, I did not leave you alone. You felt that I left you. I never left you. He led them himself. And they led them by sending leaders before them, Moses and Aaron and Miriam. God makes the case, I protected you from your enemies. Now, verse 5 references Balaam and Balak. And if those names don't sound real familiar, this probably will. It's a reference to the talk, talking donkey in Numbers. In summary, Balaam was God's prophet who repeatedly is ordered by King Balak to curse Israel with God's guidance. Balaam faithfully blesses Israel, much to Balak's disgust. The Lord will protect his people from his adversaries. The Lord will protect you from your adversaries. The Lord will protect me. He will protect his church. His church will not crumble. It will stand, right? He wants us to know that. Those stories in the Bible are there so that we know and we can learn. And our hard hearts can be soft when we read our Old Testament and say, Kind of looks like he's gone, but he's not. Does he make it easy always? No way. But he will use us, and his will will be done, and we will be protected. And this is despite their rebellion. And the covenant that the Lord and the people made in Shittim was broken by the people. And the Lord remained faithful through there. And then the covenant was renewed. We read about that in Joshua. And that's the testimony this far in this trial that the Lord has, his testimony. Now we kind of have Micah taking the stand. And Micah, as God's prophet, does what good witnesses do. And it's somewhat novel in our culture, but this witness tells the truth. Much like the Lord's testimony, Micah's testimony is also a series of questions. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Micah then starts with a right sacrifice, a yearling calves, and then moves up in value and significance from there. Thousands of animals shall I come before the Lord? Tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Be reminded of the importance of oil in Micah's culture. To us, thousand rivers of oil, big deal. But that was meant so much in their culture, right, that we've studied before. Picture the Penobscot River and the Union River just pouring oil, 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 oil. Instead of water, there's just oil pouring and pouring. He's saying, I give that all to the Lord. It's a major sacrifice, right? He's, Micah's trying to illustrate to us the sacrifice that he would give to the Lord. 
And then Micah even ups the stakes even more. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Shall I give away my child for you, Lord? Shall I sacrifice them? Shall I kill them for you? Micah could go on endlessly with what he could sacrifice in numbers of animals or children, but he does not. In this next verse, it's kind of if there's a calendar verse in the book of Micah, it's this. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? That's a quote right out of Deuteronomy. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said when he, in an introduction on this passage. This, was the, this is the essence of the law, the spiritual side of it. Its Ten Commandments are an enlargement of this verse. The law is spiritual and touches the thoughts, the intents, the emotions, the words, the actions, but especially God demands the heart. When we read the Ten Commandments, when we read Numbers or Leviticus, do we hear that? Do we hear, he has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? See, Spurgeon's right. All those sacrifices in the old system, in the old covenant, they were to illustrate exactly that. That there is no way, no sacrifice, no rivers of oil, no amount of animals, no sacrificial, sacrificing children ever gets to what the Lord truly desires. It's just a simple image to point us to this truth in Micah 6, 8. Justice, kindness, and a humble walk by his law. So our reviewing, our judge is a perfect witness. He hears all, he knows all, he sees all. That's a perfect witness. If you can have that in a court case, you're in good shape. I know all, I see all, I hear all, I perceive it all. And for Israel and Judah at this point, <laughs> that's some bad news. They are behaving wickedly. They are acting absolutely horrible. And not only are they acting horrible, but they're like, oh, the Lord is with us. Who could be against us? In the middle of their sin, in the middle of feeding on each other. And it gets worse. It's as plain to the Lord, their evil and their wickedness, as your hand in front of your face. In other words, he knows our motives and attitudes just as easily as he knows the house we live in and sees it, or this church, or a car we buy. He knows our hearts. We put a check in a plate. He sees our lust our greed. He sees our evil towards our neighbors, just like he did in Israel's day. And he sees it plainly. And this witness can call us to court at any time and call us to account because he's also on his throne. For these leaders in Israel that are mentioned in Micah that we've been learning about, he thought, they thought their religious actions meant that they would receive God's defense. And Micah 6 turns their theory on its head. Not only is he not their defense, he's their prosecutor. He makes a case against them. And this dramatic and damning testimony for these people at this court is horrible. We haven't even got to the sentencing yet. Hear what the Lord says today. You on your own are no better off than these poor suckers in Israel with no defense, with no hope of acquittal, with a case that from our text, they can't even verbalize. They don't even know what to say about what the Lord did wrong. And the Lord shows and describes and has evidence of his mercy and goodness and how he has never left them, how he's protected them, how he's kept them. 
They can't even put a case together in words. That's how weak their case is. Kind of reminds me of the book of Acts. Paul gets arrested. Gets transported all over the known world. I mean, in real in Maine, I don't know what I'm charging somebody with. Guess what? They're leaving. <laughs> That's not what happens here. They have a case here, just like those wicked rulers in Acts against Paul. And they're like, I, yeah, he's... I don't know what the charges are. Send him to Rome. Listen, God is with us. We are not alone. And we have a Savior. And praise God, it's God. See, the Savior of Micah's day was still a mystery. The Savior of 2023 need not be a mystery. We may know his stories. We may know his commands. We may know what he is like. We may learn from his disciples that have been empowered and sanctified by his Holy Spirit. We may knew, know the Bible of this day. We may know the Old Testament. We may know to know good and to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with their God. They had that truth from Deuteronomy from very early on in God's redemptive plan, right? Right? But now we have an illustration. We have a mighty illustration of what it's like to do justice, of what it's like to love kindness, of what it's like to walk humbly. We need not have any ignorance of the law. The law is summed up by verse 8. Just think what law, what lengths has this judge gone through so that we may know the law? I don't have time to go into it, but just think about that this week. What has God done so you could know his law? What wouldn't he do so you would know his law? And if you're here and you're visiting and you're like, what are you talking about? I don't hear from God. I don't know what you're talking about. There are people here. Where this church is full of people that know the answers to that or what links this Lord has done for them so that they may know righteousness and goodness, mercy. We're not always the best in this church of telling people that. Man, we'd be so blessed, every one of us. You said, what is he talking about that the Lord really wants me to know? And listen, without him, you're right to despair. If Spurgeon is right, and he is, God's concern is our thoughts, our motives, our actions, our emotions. We have no hope apart from Christ. Without Christ, we can't make it to the top of the hour without a sinful thought, let alone an action or an emotion. Listen, folks, with Christ, oh, with Christ, Micah 6 is good news. Micah 6, 8 is very, very good news. See, we can see Christ, we can celebrate Christ, we can read of Christ, we can know and practice what is good with our Bibles in our hands. We can read the Hebrew word for justice over 400 times in the Old Testament and learn what God's justice, that his justice is the only justice. Listen, the good news of Micah changes hearts. We can read and obey for ourselves the Lord's command to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it from the right or to the left so that you may achieve success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. These Israelites are not doing that. They're walking and they're talking. And they're disregarding the law of the Lord. Do you think we cannot do that? People claiming to walk with the Lord and not? And feeding on each other? Hurting each other? Building their own kingdoms up? We read of the story of Jesus dying for us. We read the apostles' description in a letter that our Lord Jesus humbling himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. 
And we learn what it's like to walk humbly with our God. Friends, with Christ, we have great hope in this trial that we've been called to today. The Lord's Spirit is now in his remnant. If you are in Christ, you are his remnant. And that Spirit's there to empower us to do what is right and to love and how to love and to walk and how to walk. And his Spirit gives us the words. His Spirit gives us a testimony that will enable his chosen to stand when he commands, answer me. What shall we cry out? Right now, if the Lord showed up, came down from his throne and said, I command you, what do you have? What would we cry out? Many of us room don't have to think very long. What do we cry out? Christ. Christ is my testimony. I have no other testimony. I have but one plea before you, judge, that Jesus died and he died for me. takes us to verse 9. We're halfway done with chapter 6. Hear this, friends, the Lord's warning. It appears the sentencing phase of this trial is about to begin, but there's still hope. And listen, warnings, Old Testament or new, they should give hope to the wise. When you're doing your reading plan, or you're listening to a message from the Old Testament. Sometimes, you, sometimes I get con- discouraged. Oh, this is rough. But if we're wise, shouldn't we be thankful that the Lord isn't doing that stuff to us, <laughs> frankly? Shouldn't we be wise that, oh, I could do better with focusing on his law, with realizing what he's done, with what Christ has done, that I have been redeemed by his son. I need those warnings. I know I need those warnings, Lord. If we pray for wisdom, will he grant it? Yeah, he promises he will. The Lord speaks again. City, fear my name. I want you to hear of the rod and of him who appointed it. Listen, this city, this town we're in, it's evil. And we've learned that in our study of Micah. But here is the Lord, one verse after describing what the the Lord desires mercifully. He calls out a warning to the city. And the warning just isn't in verse 9. It's right through to the rest of the chapter, right through to 16. He cries out, if your hearts are not changed... If you obey evil things and bow down to them, hear me and heed these warnings. This city should know justice. God has gone through great lengths so that they would know justice. But instead, this city, this nation, they hate the good and love the evil. Listen, we need this truth of the second half of this chapter today, too. God will not forget sin, and sin will be paid for. Our time on earth, spent in rejection of God and His will, will end in consequences for us. We're going to have a reflection at the end, but I just ask you to reflect right now. If you're eating and never being satisfied, If you're treading and walking and running maybe sometimes and grinding away and you are getting nowhere, if there is no fruit, is it possible you've never tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Is it possible that you've been blinded and that you are following a law but not the law. I just had a curtain removed from my life. And I was on the wrong track in a sense. And that curtain was removed. 
And I got to tell you, it's like, wow, how was I that blind? I want you to think of that. Be aware. Could it be that you participate in religious activity, much like Israel here? Remember, they're still doing their, their religious stuff, right? And then we presume on the God's salvation when we have not received by faith in his son a new heart and a heart that does seek goodness, does celebrate God's goodness, does seek biblical kindness, does rejoice in biblical kindness and mercy. Have you turned around? Some of us probably spent too much time in the past. But I think sometimes looking back and saying, what has my path revealed about me? Does it reveal a humble walk with the Lord as the Lord wants from us? Or is it in a different direction? Do you have a willingness? Can you see a willingness to have faith and trust? And with that faith and trust, when you look back at what you've been doing and how you've been spending your time and your treasure, your talents, or just how you walk out a week, is there faith in those steps you took? Or are you following your own law because you know what you know and you trust you more than you trust his word and him and his son? Any study of the New Testament shows that walking this by his law and being his child and walking by faith and not by sight is costly. And we've been warned and warned, and if you've been in the church very long, you've been warned, especially a faithful church, you've been warned over and over again that those who follow him will suffer. They will be persecuted. But listen to this. It is wise to heed the warnings of the Lord and see what it costs to not follow him. How much wiser are we if we follow these warnings and we heed these warnings in Micah? God will have justice. God will not forget our evil deeds. Our evil deeds will be paid for. For many of us, they've already been paid for. And he may mete out whatever sentence he chooses, whenever he chooses. So, friends, it looks like the Lord's tarried another hour here. And in a sense, our trial's ended. And we are guilty. And a perfect witness that knows all and sees all, happens to be the judge that also graciously lets us walk out of this courtroom and back into our lives. Church, be wise. He truly does value goodness, kindness, humble hearts. Be changed today. Fall in love with this Savior more deeply or maybe for the first time ever and trust him. You see, for one day, you will hear him say, answer me. Sing a song. <laughs>